Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that the world is treating you the way you want it to treat you. I hope that the sun is shining and the birds are singing. I hope the wind is at your back. I have something today for all of you that I think you're going to enjoy. So aloha and welcome to today's episode where we have an extraordinary guest who has dedicated over four decades to advancing mental health, personal growth, and the art of compassionate communication. Jill Robin Payne has not only carved out a distinguished career as a psychotherapist, author, and educator, but she's also pioneered the concept of be empathy, a transformative approach that fuses empathy with lighthearted banter to create stronger, more harmonious relationships. With a master's degree in clinical psychology, Jill has taught behavior modification, lectured across the country, and contributed to national discussions on mental health through her appearances on radio, television, and social media. Her journey began as the first student from her college to intern at the prestigious National Institutes of Health, followed by her master's work at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Houston. Throughout her illustrious career, Jill has developed rehabilitative programs, shared her insights at top medical conferences, and even authored guidebooks aimed at empowering the emotionally and physically challenged. Whether she's speaking on the intersection of social psychology and current events or advocating for mental health as essential as physical well-being, Jill's passion shines through. She's committed to spreading the goodness by integrating mind, body, and the power of be empathy in everything that she does. Today, we're going to explore her unique contributions to mental health, her innovative work, and her journey as an inspiring thought leader in a world that's rapidly evolving. Jill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Aloha to you, George. I'm telling you, my head just got this big. I don't know if I'll be able to fit out my house. <laughs> thank you you've been so doing, much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I you, You've been doing you so just, much. Yeah. I was going to say, you just did empathy you, by giving me, <laughs> giving me all those kudos. You know, it hits a region in the brain where I get a reward and it's just like you gave me a hundred dollar bill or some chocolate, which is my favorite. I, I, I mean, look at my face. Look at it. I'm beaming. Thank you so much. I really mean it. Yeah. Well, I, th I think you're at the forefront. Like I, I've, I see this whole new sort of awareness that seems to be emerging, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in mental health, whether right. it's in the communication we have in our families and our friends and all of our relationships. And I think that you have right. kind of been pioneering this for quite some time. Maybe you can give us a little bit of yes. background on, on, on some of the foundation stones of, of what you've been teaching. So let me give you a little bit of foundation from me. I have Please. wonder, well, my parents, I have one that is still alive, my mom, and my dad was an ophthalmologist uh, who did good deeds all across the world. Really, he, he volunteered his services in Africa. Uh, my mom has helped all anybody that needs help. She has monuments for uh, people that have needed help. I have to be very careful with what I say. And so they trained me and not just trained me. I saw they, they modeled mm. how important it is that we are not the only people in the world and that no one is perfect. And so that's how it came to be. And then I became a recreational therapist helping the mentally ill because I have a brother that has paranoid schizophrenia. And so that's how it started in the mental health field, because I wanted to help my brother. And way back when, uh, even now, they even though you hear about it, people don't really understand it, George. And so now I've, I've morphed into a communication coach and a social psychology uh, individual. So I and I say that because people, when you say therapy, what do you think of when you when I say therapy? What do you think like of? scary problems, like the psychological hey, problem. Maybe they're not trustworthy. <laughs> it, right. So I, that's how come I like to stay away from that. And mm. even when my clients see me, they, they say I'm more like a friend. I've got a couch. I've got a bunch of comfortable chairs. And <laughs> I have a desk that I never sit behind. And I let everyone pick where they want to sit. I've had some people sit on the floor. And so, <laughs> yeah. And so empathy is really where you Put both parties first because you want to think in your head, I want a win-win situation. And isn't life perception? Yeah. Think about it, right? Yeah. So I'm going to perceive that this, this interview is going to go great. And it's going to go <laughs> great. It right? is. 
Yeah, yeah, there you go. I think yeah. so. Like prior to getting started, I had mentioned to you yeah. the title of your new book, The Third Side of the Coin. And like I didn't right. even realize that. And I'm curious, right. like it was like it was like the light bulb went off in my mind. I'm like, the third side of the coin, what's she talking about? And then I look down, I'm like, right. oh yeah. And on the cover, you have like that third little coin. It's like this Ariadne oh. thread that yeah. connects everything. How did that come yes. to be? Like, maybe you could fill us in on that. I will fill you in on that. Thank so you. I I learn from people. And so I did a lot of group therapy. And when I do okay. group therapy, I do uh, what I call just the whiteboard. I'll put a word on the whiteboard and then everybody else will tell me what they think that word means to them. And then we just put all these things out there and talk and we come to a conclusion. So if I'm talking about relationships, they tell me what they think of relationships. Well, anyway, I was talking about uh, how there are two sides to a coin and uh, my, my crowd that I was talking to is they were saying, Jill, look at this coin. It has three sides. I don't remember who or what. It was just one of the times I did group because I learn a lot from people. And if people would just do that, you will learn so, so much from other people, which will make you even a better person. So that's how it came to be. And I was thinking that's what I do. I help people see another side. And I came up with, I mean, it's been 40 years. So I've been doing <laughs> I've been building on this for 40 years and I, I really, it really boomed before COVID. It boomed before right. COVID when uh, we were getting so involved with our cell phones and we were texting more. I had a client come in and she was talking to me and she just said, um, I talked to my boyfriend and he said this. And, and I said, well, did you talk or did you talk? And this right. was year, years ago. This is talking. So uh, they have group dates, uh, mm. ta talking this way. And, um, and that's okay if, if you're going to do that. The more you practice something, the better you are at it. So I am not very good at this. How, how are you, George? I don't know. I'm not. I have my, uh, my clients. They just go like this. Uh, I'm not very good. I'm better at this. And so yeah. we, we, ju we just need a balance. And so that's how I with my with my clients, the people I've been working with, I've seen what's going on. You, you you see it in the research. It's validated me, right? Yes. Uh, what is the the Surgeon General just came out with? Social media is detrimental or can be. Well, do you know? Listen, do okay. you know? Go look at go look at research. Screen time, doing what I'm doing right now. Screen time affects us and can yeah. affect us in a negative way. So they've been doing studies on this for, for years, like 10, 15 years, maybe even longer. So this is, we just need a balance and uh, think about your relationships. You need a balance. It can't yeah. always be about your partner or your friends or you, it just, we just need to remember that uh, we need to look at the dynamics and the bigger picture. Right. That's it's so well said. I I can't yeah. help but hear the imagery laden words that you're using. Like, you know, I see the other side and, you know, it's right. I, I'm just curious. That has to play a big role, not only in helping people or coaching people or working with people or even writing a book or just relationships in general. But it seems like you have a really unbelievable way of using metaphors and language that helps right. people see. Like what, how are you, what is your relationship to language and imagery and influence? Well, I do believe that if people can see it, they yes. can feel it. This is yes. what I tell my clients. The more senses you use, it's in my books. The okay. more senses you use, the more you make sense of things. So George. <laughs> I so beautiful. Be <laughs> right. So I can sit here and look at my cat and sit outside in the yard and I can have all these thoughts in my head. And unless I have schizophrenia, I can't hear it. I can't see it. I can't feel it. I can't taste it. So we need to take it out of here. It slows it down. It makes mm -hmm. you see a different perception. And uh, that's why I tell my clients to even talk on their phones because they like their phones. And if you talk in your phone and play it back to you, you've used your mouth and then yeah. you also use your ears to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess that 
I guess that's why one line of poetry can be more meaningful than a 400 page service agreement, <laughs> right? Cause you're like, right. you're, you're drinking it in. Like you're seeing right. it, you're saying right. it, you're breathing it. In. It's meaningful. Right. It, right. It, do you think that that might be the foundation for not only the conflicts we're having, but also for the empathy where it's this idea of having a meaningful conversation? Right. So again, I think before we started, okay. I showed you that I have my cell phone here. Yes. And you know what? I want you to know that I put okay. it away so I can't see it. Because if you Smart. if you have your cell phone out and it's even off and you see it, you will spend more time thinking about your cell phone than you will about the person you're with. So I recommend everybody put it away. Right. But I just wanted to show you, though, this is what we're becoming. And I've noticed that some of the people that I work with and talk to, they've gotten a more blunted affect yes. because I want you to look around. Everybody out there, look around at people on their phones. My husband loves his phone and he plays um, right. checkers. And he's like this. <laughs> And so what happens to my face? It gets blunted. And yeah. if it's blunted, I can't feel as much. And if I'm also looking at this, I'm not practicing reading your face. And if right. I can't read your face or mimic you or even mirror you, my empathy mm. is going to go down. Even though empathy is back on the rise, I, I don't know, you know, those that's research. So right. I don't know what that means because to me, if I can't read your uh, your facial cues or your body language or really relate with you and connect with you, how am I going to be empathetic with you? So this is what we need to practice more. Yeah, it's, it brings up, like I have a bunch of questions written down and I, let me just jump into oh. this first one right here. Cause I think that this is oh. big as a great segue for it. Okay. So, like, how can we, like, how can we embrace the dualities in life without being constrained by them? And what deeper truths might emerge when we view conflicts through the third side of the coin? So could you repeat that again? Yeah, I know. It's, it's kind yeah. of a complex one. I had written yeah. it down when just coming off the okay. third side of the coin because I think, right. you, know, you know, prior to this, you know, and maybe even influenced now by, by social media, like there's a lot of like dualities. Right. It's like this or that, yeah. you know, black or white. Oh, but, right. So, so how can oh, we embrace the dualities in life without being constrained yeah. by them? You know what right. I mean by that? Like, it, it seems like that's what the third side of the coin is showing us. It's like, it's exactly. not heads or tails. Look at right. this part that runs count that runs all the way around it on some level. So right. how, how can we embrace these dualities that life gives us without being constrained by them? First, I have one word. We need okay. to practice practice. <laughs> and so, so we are practicing something like I told you the phone or we're practicing uh, talking to you. We need to have a balance and humans are constantly working at a balance. Yeah. And so my feel is we need to make our life interesting. We need to make it more interesting than the little bits of what we find out on the internet. And so, and I, and I'm doing that. So we need to push ourselves because I am getting a dopamine rush. Everyone is with the little pings on your phone. Yeah. I get a, I got a dopamine rush when you just gave me the compliment. Uh, so if I'm going to constantly have something that I don't have to be motivated to do anything with, it's just here and I hear pings and I'm feeling good about it. Uh, yeah. it's, it's hard to break away. So we need to put the phone away. We need to have some safe places in our life, whether it's at the dinner table and we need to do it regularly, consistently. And I would say do it. It's like a drug. So I say do it a little bit at a time. So that's what I say. So if in the daytime you're on the, you're gaming for, I, this is what I do with my clients. They, they game for eight hours on Saturday. So if they're gaming eight hours, I said, do seven hours. And then in that other hour, fill it in with something fun. And then I may make some suggestions to that because they might not know. And so that that's what we're going to need to do because we are creating what is called black and white thinking, which is yes. what you, okay. And that's a cognitive distortion, which I'm right, you're wrong, or she's right, you know, I'm wrong e either way. And a lot, of, and also I want to talk a little bit about that with the empathy. So yeah. empathy could be uh, increasing, 
But empathy, no buts about it. Because if you say buts, I say I sit on my butt. B U T T. When you say but, if I say you're you're beautiful, and then I say but I don't like your shirt, then I just <laughs> counter. So we take that out. Okay. So okay, I, I say it a lot. Anyway, what, what we need to do though is. Um, we need to think about and step back and look at the bigger picture and then right. see, see first be dynamically watchful, which is what I have in my book. Mindful. It. Yeah. Mindful is not enough. Think about it. If you're in virtual reality, do you know that your brain cannot tell the difference? Mm, I didn't they know can't that. Tell the, no, can't tell the difference. Uh, and there, I mean, it's wonderful. People are doing surgery without hurting people, practicing, and it has wonderful things. We just need to be more aware. That's why I say we need what is called an accomplice in our life. And I can be that person's accomplice. I help people see a third side of the coin. You could be. You are an accomplice to so many people because you have a podcast. So you, and I looked at your podcast. So you help people see a different, uh, uh, another perspective, a third side of the coin in many different topics. So there you go. You, you do it yourself. Yeah. It's interesting to think about when I think about what I've done on the podcast and right. just, just having this many conversations, even though it's virtual, it's taught me so much about communication right. and maybe because it is virtual, like there may be lacking the felt presence of the other. Like I can't come up and be like, touch your shoulder and be like, Joe, that was such right. a beautiful point. Or I can't be like, right. I can't be next to you and have this pheromone exchange. We're like, that was mind blowing, Jill. Thank you. That's like right. but on some level, I feel like we could still have, you know, maybe through some sort of paralinguistics or something like there, there is something that's happening between us and conversations right. that are online that we can still learn from, right? Like we can use right. social media to better ourselves on some level, right. right? Yes, we can. We just need to understand where things are coming from okay. and that everything has a benefit. So I yeah. was just reading about, uh, someone asked me a question the other day and I, I was, well, I'm really not sure on that answer. So I research things and look up look up things, uh, yeah. not, not on TikTok or Instagram. I research, <laughs> it's, it's real important. So I'll tell my clients, look in psychology today because the well people said. there have licenses. And I'm not saying that TikTok or Instagram or any of these uh, different platforms are negative. You just need to know where the information is coming from. So yeah, so now I just lost track of what I was saying about looking up stuff. So no, it's I, true. Yeah. It, you know, if, if we get lost in this and, uh, you know, as a, I'm coming up on 50 years old. So I, I may be the generation X might be one of the last generations that was, that was born without the internet, at least in, in the Western world on some level. Right. And I think that you, you did have to go and the propaganda or the paid information that's out there wasn't as well disguised as it is now. So when right. you go to TikTok, when you go to Instagram, it's imperative right. to understand that the majority of people with whom you're getting or sharing information with have an right. agenda behind it that's usually from it's usually right. company science or it's usually, you know, right. someone that's paid money to have that influence out there. So I think it's imperative to do your own research and start looking at maybe medical journals instead of an influencer yes. or someone on that right. level. But right. yeah, I think that that is a detriment to information gathering that may not have been in existence that long ago, but it's, right. I, don't, I, I guess it, it kind of, here's a, here's another question that kind of comes to mind is like, right. when we talk about empathy and yes. staying away from our phones, do you think that we're going to get to a point where we can treat emotional landscapes with the same care and sustain, sustainability that we do with ecosystems? Can we draw that parallel and maybe learn from that? Well, I think we can learn from anything if we if we want to. We need to be okay. open, right? Yeah. So I I mean, people that come to see me, they're open to have a better life. And yes. uh, now there are some people that will go see therapists that just want to complain. Those people, those people don't come see me because I'm real direct, and I even tell them go to my my website because that's who I am. And I will give you homework. Some people would put it in file 13. Do you know people don't know what file 13 is? File 13 is the trash. And so, right. So therapists may give suggestions and 
uh, there are a lot of therapists. They just sit there and listen. I'm that's why I say I'm more like a communication coach, because if you think about it, everything's relational. I have that in my book mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll explain that later. Also, yeah, everything, is, everything is communication. Think about it. Even if I'm sitting here, not doing anything, not saying anything, my whole physique is communicating something to you. And then it's also communicating something different to you than it would be to the person beside you because of your background and your perception on things. So communication, I have people come in and they say, Joe, I, we're, I'm having trouble communicating. Well, that's a big, right? That's a yeah. big thing, huge. right? Yes. And, and I, I like to think of communication like a dance. So you want to flow. Yeah. You want to flow with the people, the cadence. I talk about cadence. And even in, in one of my book, I talk about speeds. I, I talk about people being a car. One of my favorite analogies is that I believe this is my theory that everyone is like a 1968 Camaro. They're, they're beautiful, right? They're a classic. Yeah, great I, car. I great car, right? Yes. And and so you don't want to put make it a Mercedes because then it wouldn't be that classic. So you want to tune it up, realign it, and polish it. And you want to do that as often as you can to keep it running smoothly. And you align it to keep it going straight. So if it gets off alignment, like we do in life, yeah. I, I, even me as a therapist, we, yeah. we need to be we need to be tuned up and realigned. And so that's how I think of people. And we go different speeds. Yeah. Like I like to be that red Ferrari and go 200 miles now. If you go real fast, which is what technology is doing for us, think of yourself when we are online and we are yeah. doom scrolling. We are in that Ferrari going 200 miles an hour and you can't see clearly when you are going yeah. fast. So I tell my clients, Think of your leg as having a throttle on it. Pull it back and go a little slower, whatever your speed is, so you can see clearer, so you can see the red flags. So you might even see a good looking hunk over there. I mean, there's so many, th there's so many things you may be missing, right? Yeah. And, and so this is, we just need to, uh, we need to start looking at ourselves and our life and if our world is cluttered, then we need to look at ourselves first and get to love ourselves and find out who we are. I mean, it takes, sometimes we never find out who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Does it take courage to slow down? <laughs> can, can I tell you a funny story? Uh, please, I would love that. I, I think it's funny because I tell this to my couples okay. that will come in. So one day, this was probably about two years ago. And I just celebrated my 10th year anniversary on my second oh, marriage. Oh, happy anniversary. But thank you. Till death do us part. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm sitting with, his name's Byron. And we're sitting watching TV and I'm looking at him and I'm going, Byron, all you do is sit and watch TV and stuff your face. It's gross. So you know what he said to me? He goes, well, Jill, that's what you're doing. And I... <laughs> And I said, you're right. Yeah. He's a therapist too, by the way. Imagine and, that. Uh, yeah. It's, it's very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah. But he's, he's more analytical than me. <laughs> I, he is, he is constantly analyzing me. And let me tell you something. I just, I need, I do my, bye. I, I, I go walk and take a walk. Uh, so that's exactly what you said. So it's sometimes it's just easier to look at other people to blame and even blame. Mm. I, I, I don't even like blame. I, mm. I like to just say it's the dynamics and we need to take responsibility that we're not perfect. So not so much blame. That blame word is, I don't know, when I say blame, it's a word. What, what do you think of when I say blame? I think of like what? a wet blanket. Yeah, and my face. <laughs> like, yes, my face. blame them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Put it on so them. Yeah. So just let's take responsibility that we're all imperfect. I let my clients know I'm imperfect, you yeah. know, and, and it's important because people like to be with people that they know, uh, that they know aren't perfect, that they know that, that, that person might know what they know. They just know that they're not perfect. And then they feel more at home with that person. Yeah. 
in, in your experience and, and in your opinion, do you yeah. think that that's what we're seeking out in relationships is sort of like this Jungian mirror, or maybe you could give some aspect. Like it seems that there's patterns in these relationships. Like we find someone with whom sometimes right. we think we find someone who will fix us subconsciously, or yeah. maybe we, we see right. ourselves in someone else, but maybe you right. could speak to the idea of patterns in relationships. Well, gosh, that's a, that's big. I know. Uh, so, so, we, there is something called the attachment theory that I will have clients look up themselves. And okay. by the way, I like people to do their own homework because it gets you to remember it and retain it better. If I just tell you something, you're more likely to forget it. It means yeah. more if you look it up. I, I give some things and then, so they'll look that up. That's one thing that does affect you. And so when you're raised with parent figures, it doesn't matter who they are. Usually, it depends on what theorist you're talking to. Mm -hmm. We will try to, let's say if we had a parent figure that worked a lot. Yeah. And, and so they weren't there for us. So we'll, we may be attracted to emotionally unavailable people mm -hmm. or people yeah. that aren't so much there. Uh, and because we're trying to uh, relive that and fix it. That's the easiest way I can explain it. Mm -hmm. And so... All we need to do is I have people do this is write down a list of the characteristics of the people that you want in your life. That's friends, that's lovers, that's anybody. And that's what you need to stick with. The problem is a lot of times we put down what we don't want. <laughs> and so, yeah. So I, I have my clients do it and then we go over it and then we edit it. So there's a lot of times I'll say, I want my husband to stop nagging me. Well, then my brain here is nagging. So I want my husband to speak to me with respect. Mm. See, do you see the difference? Yeah. And so, and, and we do that. And then also a lot of people don't even know what they want. So you know what I do? I tell them, what? Write, write down what you don't want. And then on the opposite side, you write the opposite. And that's what you do want. And then if they've had a tragic relationship, I tell mm -hmm. them, write down all the negative qualities of that person and then write down the opposite of, of that, of those characteristics. And that needs to be at the top of your list so that you don't go back and find that person. That's beautiful information. Thanks for sharing that. Right. I, I feel like if I did that exercise, then the list of things that I don't want would probably be things about myself that I don't like. <laughs> Is that does that sound too crazy? Or have you found that is that something that happens? Yes, that that, that is that. Yes. There's so <laughs> many different. Do you know we are so complex, yet we are so simple. So yeah. so so we're simple to the uh to the aspect that we want to feel, we want to fit in, we want to be appreciated, we we want to be respected, and we want to be heard. So yeah. that's the simplicity. Yeah. The the difficult part is we are so complex because no one has the same brain. No one mm. has the same retina. No one has the same fingerprints, not even identical twins. So everyone, including me and you, have a different language. For, forget the men and women, okay? Yeah. I don't care if you're a them, that, or an it. Everyone has a different language. And we need to be more aware of the cadence and the words that other people use. And the more that you can mirror it, mirror it and reflect it, the more that they will listen to you. Right. Yeah. And you'll connect. Yeah. That is beautiful. I, I love you. the, yeah, of course. I, I love the analogy of the Camaro. And I, when I think about oh. that, like the word authenticity comes up for me. And right. we talked about the Camaro going fast, but yes, it seems that so many of us, especially in today's world with the cell phone or with social media, like right. we are trying to put that Mercedes emblem on the Camaro and just trick everybody. Like, hey, this is a n old new Mercedes over here. Like, what is it like? And that that seems to be the fear on some level. What, in your opinion, like, is there a relationship between fear and authenticity? Well, will you remind me that? And because yes. I want to say one thing of what you yeah, just please, said. Please, please. I have these young people telling me, I don't, I do not put a filter on when I go online. Love it. And I'm, yeah, maybe I should. <laughs> And so, and so what they're telling me is that when they put a, they put a filter online and they want to still have that filter, and we're not talking about just the outside, the inside filter, 
They want to have that when they're in the real world. So if you are not being authentic, then you are not going to be happy with yourself. You will feel Mm -hmm. displaced and it will cause depression, stress, uh, anxiety, all these things that are going on. That's one of the many things. So that might have even answered your question. So I think it's interesting. And FYI, plastic surgeons are getting a lot more work, a lot more business. Yeah. Wow. Because people wow. want to look like they do online. Yeah, and especially with all these crazy new filters and stuff, you just put a filter on and you don't have any right. blemishes. You look like your face is more symmetrical. Like it's so right. it's so yeah. interesting to see the right. the painted masks and rattles we still use. <laughs> they, they even they even do if you look at, at TikTok and maybe Instagram too, they they will turn you into a cartoon. Which yeah, I think is which I think is interesting because that will bring me to this. Th- yeah. This is this was a cover of th- this other book. The the book okay. now is is this. I, I changed okay. it because people thought this was for kids. It's for adults. I came up. What makes my empathy unique? And I'm okay. I'm going to work George to animate him myself because we have AI. I'm yeah. going to. I might take a course. I want to animate these these characters because this is Beacon. This is Brighton. And this is Bo. This was my dog that died a year mm. ago. I, I found her on the street. She was, she <laughs> saved me. She was wonderful. Anyway, right. so these are uh, fraternal twins. So he is of color and he's a minute older. So he is the leader. Someone said, how come you made a guy a leader? I don't know because the name Beacon to me seems right. like a guy. I don't, who knows? And yeah. so anyway, he looks like a lighthouse and he is the beacon mm. of life. And he shines on his sister and enlightens her. And she has starry eyes. And then you have little Bo that's always by her side, helps things, helps tie things together and is the compromiser. So we are all, okay, we can be all these or one of them. These are the Great. three, pers- these are the three personalities in our world. Think about it. A- an instigator is a leader. So that's mm. it. Those are, those are the first, pers- so you think what, what person, you're probably a leader and I bet you do compromising. Right. Yeah. Because you're from Hawaii and, uh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I work at the boys and girls club on the, on afternoons. And I, I gotta oh, tell you, you yeah. there is nothing more psychologically rewarding and challenging and fascinating than dealing with a group of second graders. Like all the emotion is raw. You see the beacons, you see the brightens and you see it in the same individual and you can't help but be like, Oh my gosh, this is me. This many years ago. Oh my gosh, this is a situation that's happened in my life. Like it's, it's so beautiful to get to see the psychology playing out and, and doing, but, but this brings up this idea of, of you had mentioned that this is the, the attitudes of our world. Not, you didn't say attitudes, but like beacon, brighten. Personalities, personalities. Yeah. Okay. Can we extend that to like generations on some level? When I see these, these Instagram filters and when I see technology coming up, I see the kids without a rite of passage from a wisdom keeper. And I know I'm kind of going through different areas right there, but it seems like we're lacking the wisdom keepers and the rites of passage and the handing down of wisdom. Instead, we're getting AI, we're getting new filters and we're getting this bottom up transition of technology but right. maybe you could speak to this idea of rites of passage in, in, in the beacons. We need, do you think maybe we need some more beacons from the, from the, from the older wisdom keepers? So I think we need to have people model what they talk about. I love about. that. I love that. So yes. I, I, you know, one thing my son loves about me, there's probably some things that I, that drive him crazy is that he says, mom, you know, when you've made a mistake, you know your imperfections and then you let people know. And I think that that is a good thing for us to accept our imperfections and it makes us wonderful. If you go to places where they have all yeah. this plastic surgery, I'm, I'm, I'm for plastic surgery. I mean, uh, you know, I, I want to look good too. But what I'm saying is if, if you make yourself look too perfect, you look pretty, you don't look beautiful. Wow, so it's, I like the, it's the it's the imperfections yes. that make us look beautiful. Yeah. Right. And that's what I think we need to not dwell on our imperfections. How can we use that imperfection 
to make us this wonderful person that we really are or can be or improve ourselves. So that I'm constantly working on, you can see how I'm so, I exude a lot of energy. Yes. So, so I, I work, <laughs> I work at channeling that because sometimes that can be too much for people. And so when you come see me in my office, it's, it's more channel. I still get excited. It's more channeled. So that's what I'm saying. So, so you love it. Although I, <laughs> it can, it can be, it's all how you look at things. So I can call it, it got me in trouble when I was younger. So when I'd work with people, people would take it wrong. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I, 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 you're preaching to the choir. I, I feel like I exude a similar amount of energy to people and it can be very <laughs> off-putting. <laughs> Well, and I'm and I'm enjoying it. That's why when when you were talking and you said all these wonderful things about me, I swear that is going to that has made my day the whole day, the whole day. Even asking before you even really got to know me, asking if I could be on again that that is such a big compliment. You, you know, my I'll tell you may I tell you another story? Please, I would love uh, that. Okay. So I love my mom and she is still alive today at 91 and she's just a pistol. She's done so many good deeds for all. I cannot tell you mm -hmm. just so many good deeds. Anyway, so she went to see this famous actor. I don't know who he was in some type of play. And she was allowed to go backstage to see him. I wish I could remember his name. And she goes up to him and he, and he turns to her and he goes, did I do okay? And my mom and my mom's like, oh, yes, you're fabulous. Here, this famous person that is known for being the best of all actors in, in uh, the theater asked my mom, was I OK? So we're human and we just need to realize that, that everyone, no matter this, this, we need to stop putting people on pedestals because they're falling off. So. Even when my clients will compliment me, I will tell them. I had someone just say all these wonderful things the other day. I said, I, I want you to know that I'm imperfect. <laughs> and I told her, I said, because I don't want you to put me on a pedestal because then I'm going to fall. So we, we want to, it's not so much that we're equal because come on, there's some people that work yeah. harder than others as humans yeah. and uh, to, to just we, we have pain and uh, not all of us. There's like a small smid smidgen that don't, they die young, by the way. So most of us have pain and most of us want to avoid pain. We'll do it from e eating, doing scrolling, yeah. what, whatever it takes to avoid the pain. Yeah. And we just need to remember that. So I'm hoping this, just even that with my empathy will get people to realize that. And the reason I talk about dynamic watchfulness and not mindfulness anymore because mm. mindfulness to me is just too much about me. And mm. we have technology now, and it is a part of our life, George. And yes. we can't just say, I'm not letting my kids on the phone. No, it's a part of our life. And we need to learn how to work with it. When I was younger and the TV came to be, my mom and dad told, told me, everybody else got to watch a lot of TV. I was only allowed one hour of TV. That was it. And if I didn't do my homework, I didn't get any. So it's all how we deal with this. We need to understand we are working with technology and, and, and it's working for us, right? Yeah. We're having a good yeah. time. And, and we just need to work with it, not work against it. Work with it. Yeah. I, I love it. I, I can't yeah. help but think of the, the, uh, the great book by Marshall McLuhan called The Gutenberg Galaxy, where he talks about the yeah. way in which the printing press fundamentally changed the way we interpret yeah. ourselves and the world around us with concepts yeah. like exact repeatability. And then now yeah. we have this new format or this derivative right. of it's fundamentally changing how we communicate right. on some level. Do you think that we can, right. we're going to see profound changes the same way the printing press gave us profound changes? And yes, yes. And I think it's, it's positive and negative. Yeah. I, of course. I, it's, and it is how we look at it. Yeah. Uh, to me, I, my, this is me as okay. I, I tell people, I'm one therapist. This is me with my 40 years of doing this that I think, 
and love people. And I, I know you are the same. I love people. Yeah. I, I know that there's some people that might get on my nerves. I might get on some people's. I love, I truly love people. And if you love cats or love people, it's, it's going to come through. And I think we need to be more into loving and caring about the human race and then everything will fall into place. That rhymed. That rhymed. Say it again. Let's hear it again. I don't know if I can do it. It's like my pot. <laughs> okay. We, we need to love the human race and then everything will fall into place. That's beautiful. <laughs> it's so easy. And that's Poetry. what my books do. Yeah. I guess. Anyway. And so my books simplify things such as that. And I give many different techniques like we're talking about. To me, it's common sense. Just like when you do your podcast, I couldn't not podcast. It was too difficult for me. Anyway, for you, it's probably common sense. You have the mic, you put your lighting up and it, it makes sense to you. Right. And we yeah. all have, we all have our place and our specialties and our gifts. So we need to find it and then share it with others. I think that's, that's my feel. And it makes us feel good to, to do that. When they, like, there's a lot of things that I love about our conversation so far, but one thing I really want to touch oh on is this idea yes. of like, you're creating a new word that represents a new set of ideas that doesn't have a yeah. whole lot of residue on it. And like, you know, you can't uh, go anywhere without a linguistic pathway. Like, is this something you uh, put a lot of thought into? Like, it's a brilliant thing to do. Can you oh, tell us so about sweet. that process? What's oh, the truth? Yes. It's wonderful. I would love to learn more. Uh, so I'm always thinking. And when I, we're all always thinking, I, I know we're not supposed to say always and never. Our brain is constantly going some people more than others. Yeah. For instance, today I was up at one o'clock and I'm, okay. and uh, I'm thinking how I can, I'm, I'm the power of attorney yeah. over my brother and my mom's night. So I'm thinking of all the, all the things that I can do to make things better. And so because of that, I was thinking about the world. If I could sprinkle happy dust on everyone, George, I would do it. My clients laugh at me because they say, oh, yeah. you would. So since I couldn't do that, I created what I believe we need in the world. And that is to banter, which is lighthearted chit chat. What happened to humor? And mm. humor needs to be done in the right place at the right time. In my books, I have TP which is not toilet paper. It's, <laughs> I, it's timing and position. If I go down mm. Westheimer in Houston, Texas, I can just as easily hit the red lights as I can hit green lights. Yes. So, yeah. So, so we need to be more uh, thinking about this. And, and that's what I was thinking about with my empathy. So to right. put that with something heavy, like empathy. Yeah. Because empathy is deep. Do you know... This happened one time with one client and I'll never forget it. I won't forget it. Okay. So I am very empathetic. Women, by the way, are more empathetic than men. We, we can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, and there's, pe there's people that are more empathetic than others. I am very empathetic. I can feel energy. And matter of fact, if I'm not in a good mood, you don't even want to be in my, my room. Okay. So this one particular day, I was seeing over 40 clients a week during COVID. And I was seeing one of my wonderful clients and I was sympathizing with that client, not empathizing one time. And there was such a, I got goosebumps. There was such a disconnect. I felt that I owed that client another session. And I, and I, I believe that client even felt it. Sympathy mm. is feeling for somebody. Whereas empathy is, is, being with that feeling with that person. It goes a lot deeper than that. And, and it's easier to sympathize. And I yeah. do believe that a lot of people are doing that and people take it as they're really empathizing and without empathy, you cannot be compassionate. And mm. just because you have empathy does not mean you're compassionate. Compassion is an act. It's sort of, if, if I see you and I saw you had a bunch of books and I opened the door for you, I'm being compassionate. So it's an act of act of service. And so we need to, uh, I guess, practice this. And that's how I got with this empathy. I was just watching yeah. how things were tra uh, transpiring. And I wanted, what could I, I was going to come up with, um, what did I come up with? Uh, schmooze, it was going to be schmooze and empathy. 
schmempathy. And somebody had already, <laughs> do you like that? Yeah, I like and it, yeah. So, so schmempathy was my first. And then I looked it up and somebody had already used that. It wasn't trademarked or anything. And I said, you know what? I don't like that anyway. And so then I said, you know, what about banter? Banter and empathy, empathy. And that's how I, I mean, I really thought of it. And then my characters, I remember talking to my dad and his caregiver for a whole year. I would call them up and say, what? I need some characters to go with my empathy because people relate better with cartoon characters, even adults. Come on, what did what did Park City? What what are those cartoons that the South Park, the, South um, Park. Family yeah. Guy, all of exactly. these exactly cartoons right. that came out? Yeah, yes, because see, they're more expressive and they're easier to read. So people relate. So I said, I want something like that. And so they would come up with these really intellectual words, and so then I would look. I like to simplify things. Yeah. I'm, yeah. And so I simplified with beacon, beacon of light. A beacon is, what does a lighthouse do? It helps guide you, right? Mm. It's not a boss. It guides you. It brightens your life. It's a beautiful. And then I even described the, what the person would look like to my graphic artist. And then I said, I think fraternal twins, because I want them connected. And then I said, what could the girl brighten? She's brightened. And then yeah. we, he, he came up with the starry eyes. Uh, and then my dog came about a year later. I was walking Hershey. I was walking Hershey. Her, and Hershey saved me, by the way. I was in a very bad accident in 2010 where I even mm -hmm. had PTSD for two years. Really, really bad. And uh, I found Hershey or Hershey found me on the street. I do believe in this. I don't know if you believe. I believe in energy. My, my son buys me things from Hawaii with the peace sign and all that. I believe in it. Yeah, so I'm with her, you. Her, yeah, Hershey came up to me in the Fifth Ward, which is a, a not a great section in Houston, Texas. Uh, I was working there uh, contracting. Mm -hmm. And and uh, Hershey came up to me and said, take me home. And uh, the uh, vet told me that that day when I took her there for four hundred and something dollars that Hershey would have died if I didn't if I didn't uh, pick her up that day. No buts. Hershey picked me up. So, <laughs> you know how. So anyway, so I'm walking Hershey. That was a side side story. So I'm walking Hershey one day, and I'm looking down at her, and I said, "You know what? Hershey gets me to see another side of the coin. Hershey gets me to step back and learn how to compromise." I and I said, "You know what? I'm going to use Hershey." But I said, "Let's use a bow, because a bow, because she's a girl, Hershey." will help tie everything together, a compromiser. Yeah. Right. That's how I came up with that. Thank you for letting me share that. That was, thank you. That was wonderful. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Well, I think it's imperative. Like I, not only a linguistic pathway, but so many symbolic references, like that makes it land so much more significantly, whether it's a bow or a lighthouse yeah. or the idea of a, a, a cartoon character that is able to be bigger than life on some level. Like, right. Yeah. I, I think it just, it shows how, how powerful communication can be. Maybe it, maybe it's, right. it's explains how empathy can be like, it's, it's a whole new right. world of expression. And, you right. know, I, I can't help but see a spiritual component in there too. Is there a spiritual yes. component to it? Oh, Yes. I just told you how how little Hirsch came to me, right? And right. and and think about being enlightened, uh, or the 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 light. The yes. Matter of fact, when when I do meditation with my clients or I do uh, visualization, I use a a warm white light or a soothing white light that protects you. So it's it's showing that it's bigger than us, and yes. that's what spirituality is. That there's more to the world than just us. And you know what? It takes a load off of us. It yeah. enlightens us. There you yes. go. So there you go. So the, the beacon of light is bigger and brighter. Right. There you go. It's, right. It, 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 it brings up this idea that if you can see the trauma, the things that happen in your life, like the biggest <sighs> mistakes, the biggest, the, the death of a child, the death of a loved one, someone that maybe is suffering from mental illness, like 
Right. Isn't it interesting how these are the things that unite us as human beings? They transcend race. Right. They transcend gender. They trans everything. Right. They're like, you are part of something bigger. And only once you've begun to touch that fire that burns right. brighter than any light, do you become someone with the experience to help other people through it on some level, right? Isn't it, it's so beautiful right. to think about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> you you made me smile because I tell my clients the reason I'm a good therapist is because I've been through so much. Yes. So and it's yeah. so true because if you've been through something, you may not feel what they feel. You get it. You get that that is yep. very painful. And it's really interesting that someone was talking to me the other day about how can we get Gen Zs to to feel more and to understand relationships better, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I think it was my son that, that was saying that he's 33. And he was saying, because they think different, they're looking at the sure. devices. And so I said through movies, just like Walt Disney did for us, think about it. He made it for mm -hmm. adults and children. And they usually somebody died at the beginning. It was, yeah. if you think of Bambi, Bambi. one of my favorites, yes. the mom dies. Right. And yeah. I still remember the movie. And so that way through movies that will help our children also learn. We need to have fun, educating movies that show and model behavior of, of not just caring, but what do you do with that? When you empathize, what do you do with it? <laughs> How does it help you? Because uh, I could be a Republican and dem Democrat, and I'm going to yeah. empathize with my my peeps. If I empathize with my peeps, then I'm I'm going to look at the other side and go, well, they're wrong. So so we need to understand what empathy is. I, um, empathy has some positive and negative. So we need to. What do you do with empathy? And that's to me what empathy is about. It's your 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 chit chatting. And empathizing and going back and forth and the mindset in my books and how I believe when you come to see me or whoever my friends are, I want to make that situation a win-win. Yeah. And I always I use this, I use the car dealer. The the, the car dealer. Okay. You want him to think he won, and he wants to think he wants you to think that you won because he wants you to come back. Right. And you want to think, you want him to think that you, that he won. So he gives you a good deal. So I say, it's not manipulation. It's just, mm. it's just making it, it, making people feel good. If, if my husband loses a fight with me yeah. or a discussion, then we both lost. Yeah. We both lost. That's, that's, yeah. that's my thing. That's my thought. So that's, I love that's, it. you do like that. And so that's I how I, yeah. So I get my clients to, to just maybe change your mindset. See, we're having so much fun. And I, I had looked you up <laughs> and well, it's important to know who you're talking with and uh, you know what your name is. So uh, saying your name, George, a couple yeah. of times, people like that. It makes us feel good and it makes me feel good. So like for birthdays, I, I take my friends out for their birthday because I get to, I get to win. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sharing. I'm sharing. I could even have my favorite dessert. We're having a great time, I think. Right? So do you see what I'm saying? So we need to just, if we could think that way, and, and uh, their bosses that you might not like, you're going to need to work with them. So how can you make that a win-win? You know? Sometimes you can't. I mean, come on. Uh, nothing is perfect. So some things you're going to need to walk away and uh, move on and get a tune up, get realigned and go a different direction. There you go. Yeah, it's true. I, I'm thankful for the, yeah. the changing awareness that seems to be happening. And I, I, it, when we think about social media and we think right. about empathizing on some ways, I, 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 I feel like this next generation that was born into this world of social media, like they're the first ones to have their entire lives be online, you know, and we, you and I could probably remember back to things like, man, I am sure glad that wasn't online. You know, I know that I can't like, whoa, I'm glad that wasn't online, but there's going to be a generation of people that have it online and they're going to look right. back at the young next generation and be like, oh, I remember when I put that online, you know, on some level you can see this 
right. you can see empathy beginning to find its way into the, oh, the yeah. next generation, but it hasn't yeah. got all, it hasn't made its move all the way through yeah. on some level. Yeah. It's that's, but, that's what I was saying. This person that, uh, does, uh, it's, I think her name's Con Conrath, uh, I, Sarah Conrath. Anyway, uh, she does studies. She's at University of Michigan and she does studies okay. about empathy. And she just did another study and she was saying that empathy is on the rise. So she said it's right. fluid. It's exactly what you're saying. So it is fluid. Yeah. And I do believe everything is cyclical, even our history yes. with, with our anger. If you go back to the 60s, we had a lot yeah. of... I, it's, it's just cyclical. And we just need to be aware of it. I do believe I do believe it's not just I believe they've done research that, that <laughs> well, I mean they've done they've done studies and they're going to find more oh, studies yeah. that the this technology that we're bringing that's not man made that is not spiritual is changing the brain structures yeah it's it's shrinking the frontal lobe it's doing bunches of different stuff to the frontal lobe and they'll find out other things because. You can, they're just starting to do research on virtual reality. So virtual reality is just starting, George. So they're not, when you do virtual reality, sometimes you get headaches because it's, you're just using your eyes. They're not doing smell. They're not using all your senses yet. So yeah. that if, if I pick up a pen in virtual reality, I'm only using one part of my brain. Whereas if I do this right now in reality, I'm just, my whole brain is lighting up. So what my fear is, is what is happening is that our brain structure is going to change and not go back. So right now they think it will go back. So there's something mm -hmm. called neuro neuroplasticity, which I love. Right. And I, I use, okay, so you know all about that. And I use that with my clients. I've worked with pain patients. I, I've worked with uh, people with trauma and you can change the structure of your brain. Usually they say if you you stop exercising, yeah. like your muscle goes to your muscle goes to flab, right? So your sure. brain does does the same. It goes to baseline. My my fear is that we're going to change the brain structure because if I change the brain structure of my brain and then I have a baby, so many things are genetics. Or, yeah. And they they even did a study. Go look up the snail theory, the okay. snail snail Thank study. You snail study. And what they did was they injected, uh, they had a snail. This was mean. And they, they shocked it. They shocked the snail. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so the snail, that snail avoided that place where it was being shocked. So they took the RNA from that snail and put it into another snail and put that snail in the same position. And that snail that never was shocked avoided that little area that he could have gotten shocked. So they're saying that trauma is hereditary. I, I, to me, everything yeah. is genetics. Uh, it's, uh, they say 50-50, nurture nature, who knows? I do know a lot is genetics. I do know that nature does help because otherwise I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> Without so, a doubt. Yeah. I think it, I, I agree. I know we're kind of coming up on the on the closing of it, but I, like this is oh. we'll get into this when you come back. Or, or do you, how are you doing on time? I, okay, I don't know. Um, actually, <laughs> it's it's, it's actually, about that time. Right? We did a whole we did a whole hour. It's, you are wonderful. You well, are such a such a great host. Really, thank, thank you. you. Thank. Yeah. I, I didn't even get through any I, of my. I did like one question, and I have like another ten. But I, when you come I hope back, I said what you needed. All of it. I would love to get into the idea of changing brain chemistry, default mode network, psychedelics, and the idea in which we can revisit our trauma in a meaningful way and almost a third person oh. point of view. Because I've been talking to a lot of people about this and maybe I'll have you come on with yeah. another guest. Anyways, yeah. I will just keep talking if I don't cut you short, if I don't cut it off right now. But before I do that, yes, where can people find you? What do you have coming up and what are you excited about? Gosh, I have a bunch of podcasts coming up and okay. I don't know. I don't know what they're, I'd have to go look. So just look me up. I'm Jill Robin Payne, J-I-L-L-P-A-Y-N-E, and Robin like the bird, R-O-B-I-N. And I and I think if you look up my platforms, it's at, and my website is jillrobinpayne.com. And so uh, look, look me up, email me. I tell people that, and uh, I would love to hear from people. 
Anything that they the would like me to talk about. Yeah. All the links will be in the show notes. So with you're within the sound of our voice, whether it's today, whether you're live streaming five, 10, eight years from now, whenever it is, go down to the show notes and reach out to Jill. She's an incredible storyteller. She has 40 years oh. of experience and she's pioneering the ways in which we're going to be living in the future. And I really appreciate your time. Hang on briefly afterwards, but to everybody else, I hope you have a beautiful day and go down, check out her books. They'll really help you see the world in a different way, in my opinion. And in her opinion, I think she would agree. That's all we got, ladies and gentlemen. Aloha. That are we?